We have uh, Alec Ridgway. He will be uh, telling us about uh, something slightly different than our usual fair. He's okay. got a couple of good theories and such. Uh, about and, and, and time limit. So this one will be about imprints of massive scalars on primordial non gaussianities All right, thanks, Will, and thank you for the invitation, Margaret. Fun. Uh, and it's a pleasure to talk about some of my work on memorial non gaussianities which could have occurred in the hypothetical and inflationary era of the universe. All the original stuff I'll be talking about is based off these four papers, which I did with my collaborators, Hai Ping An, Michael McEnany, Mark Wise, and Mikhail Sabon. All right, so my talk will be mostly about adding extra fields to the inflationary era and see how it affects the dynamics and how many you can see it large-scale structure observables that we make today. But before I go into that, I'd like to kind of motivate why we think that there should be an inflationary era. So I'll spend a couple slides doing that. So after inflation, um, the universe enters what's known as a standard Big Bang uh, cosmology, which is also known as Lambda CDM. And what's remarkable about Lambda CDM is that all cosmological to date, all, sorry, all cosmolog cosmological observations to date up to maybe this Hubble tension, which um, um, might be there, um, are well described by the lambda CDM, which is fixed by the following six parameters. The primordial spectral tilt, the amplitude of the initial curvature fluctuations, the energy densities and baryons of cold dark matter, the optical depth of reionization, and the angular acoustic scale. It's just six parameters that can describe a plethora of cosmological phenomena, ranging from the Hubble expansion of the universe the relative abundance of the light elements, such as lithium, helium, and deuteron, the NS entropies in the cosmic microwave background, and inhomogeneities that we see in large scale structure. Now, in spite of this success, um, standard Big Bang picture seems to require a couple of fine tunings of initial conditions, which are known as the Big Bang puzzles. And this is what will ultimately lead to the motivation for um, inflation. So I'm going to describe these big bang puzzles. The first one is known as the horizon problem. So as we all know, the cosmic microwave background obeys to one part of 10 to the minus 5 a black body spectrum with near an isotropic temperature, um, the temperature being 2.7 Kelvin. Now, this seems a little bit puzzling because when you look at opposite directions of the sky, light from those directions is just coming into causal contact today. What's strange is the light from those directions seems to be at the same temperature. It's actually kind of worse than that. In this little cartoon here, these bubbles are supposed to represent the causal horizons at the time of recombination when the CMB forms. And if you do the calculation right, there should be a hundred such um, different horizons. Now, if these horizons were really not in causal contact with each other, it seems a little strange that light coming from them to us today all has approximately the same temperature. You would think that maybe there was no tuning, you would see diff different temperatures in the sky. But that's not what we see. The second big bang puzzle is what's known as the curvature problem, which is why is the spatial curvature of the universe observed to be so close to flat. This is puzzling because the Friedman equation governing the evolution of the scale factor with the energy density of the universe says that the energy density and curvature is directly related to the square of the horizon size, 1 over AH. Where a is the scale factor, and H is the Hubble constant. In a standard Big Bang scenario, this horizon size just increases from the time of the Big Bang. It's only gotten bigger in time. That means that if the, curve, if the energy density and curvature was small today, it was even smaller earlier on. And the question is what physical mechanism or tuning was, I mean, I guess you can tune it, but is there a physical mechanism that makes the curvature energy density smaller earlier on? Right, so those are the two big things. Uh, yeah, I think course. I missed the point. One slide back. Yeah. The, I thought the original problem was precisely that uh, inflation solves this. Yeah, it does. I'm going to describe why. Uh, it does. Yeah. I'm just motivating why, like, if you have radiation dom yeah, domination followed by matter domination, this would be puzzling. Now, it turns out that inflationary era elegantly uh, solves both the uh, solves both of these problems in kind of one fell swoop. Um, the idea is before radiation domination, shortly after the Big Bang, the universe underwent a period where the scale factor goes like an exponential. It just grows, it inflates, it grows super rapidly. 
And it turns out that this rapid expansion will explain the horizon curve, or will provide solutions to the horizon curve problems. All right, so this is the way that the horizon problem is solved. The idea is that these regions in the sky that look like they're just coming into causal contact today were actually in causal contact at an earlier point in the universe. Specifically, right before inflation started, the entire observable universe today was in causal contact and had a chance to thermalize and talk to each other. It's only after inflation, which decreases the horizon size because of the rapid expansion, that pushes each of these regions outside of each other's causal horizons. And it's only until today that they're coming back in. But that's why the energy looks so isotropic, uh, uh, the temperature looks so isotropic. They were all talking to each other at an early point in the evolution universe. All right. uh, the solution to the curvature problem is pretty, um, pretty slick as well. Um, remember that the energy density and curvature goes like the horizon size squared, or one over the scale factor squared. Well, during inflation, the scale factor goes like e to the ht. It grows exponentially quickly. This means that the energy density and curvature decays exponentially quickly. That means that inflation can drive the curvature energy density to be exponentially small, which is consistent with the small value that we observe today. The question then is, what kind of universe will have exponential growth? Well, the Friedman equation tells us that if we want to have an exponential scale factor, the universe has to be dominated by some form of energy, which is constant. Well, how do we achieve a constant energy density? We just look at the continuity equation. We see that the pressure has to be exactly negative to the energy density. And then we find that the universe has to be dominated by some kind of fluid or substance with a negative um, equation of state. This is very different from what we're used to. Cold dark matter, for example, has no pressure, and radiation has positive pressure. So this is kind of a new form of matter that has to, well, just a new equation of state. Well, it turns out that um, just a simple scalar field can provide such an equation of state. It's kind of remarkable how much a scalar field can do for you. Um, you can easily see from the stress energy tensor that um, the pressure divided by the energy density goes like the kinetic energy minus the potential divided by the total energy. So if the kinetic energy is very small and it has a non-zero potential, or the scalar field has a non-zero potential energy, the scalar field will be known as the infanton from here on out. Then this kinetic energy term can be neglected, and you see the equation of state is nearly equal to minus one. So this is the idea behind slow roll inflation. You have a scalar field, the infanton, that has a non-trivial potential with some global minima. And it start, this infanton starts away from that minimum, so it has a non-zero potential energy. Initially, the potential is very flat, so that there's a, time, there's a period of time where the kinetic energy is small. And therefore, the equation states equal to minus 1. After about 50 to 60 e volts, which is sufficient to solve the horizon curvature problems, the potential becomes steeper. steeper. The infanton's kinetic energy picks up. And then you no longer have an equation state of approximately minus 1. You exit the inflationary era, which is 0.5 in. And then you enter the reheating era, which could be the infanton transitioning its um, energy into like standard model particles. That's one way it can be done. And then, um, and then after reheating, you enter radiation domination, matter domination, the standard Big Bang cosmology. What about the cosmological constant? You don't that, have to say anything about that when you want to. That is this V, this constant uh, energy density, which I will say right now. Um, so the intuitive idea is that the infanton potential energy is the cosmological constant still in all of space, and that cosmological constant is what's driving um, the exponential expansion, and it sources the center space time. The Hubble constant is related to V in this way. And we're going to assume it's not completely true uh, that the Hubble constant is truly constant during inflation. It's, the infinite time is, is moving, however, which will make this age a function of time. Uh, but these are, this is, in general, um, a small correction characterized by these slow roll parameters, which we are going to neglect for the rest of the talk. We can just assume that H is constant for the computation of non-gas standards, which I will describe later. Aside from, or in addition to providing a very elegant explanation for uh, the Big Bang puzzles, um, inflation provides uh, a kind of beautiful quantum mechanical origin 
from the anise octopase and, and homogeneities we see in the CMB and RTL structure. The idea is that the infilton is a quantum mechanical field, meaning that its background bev obeys a classical trajectory that's spatially independent, but it's time dependent. And then at each different point in space, the infilton is fluctuating around that classical trajectory. This means that as the trajectory nears the end of inflation phi m, the infilton field can not at different points in space fluctuate across this point phi n or fluctuate right, right before it. And effectively what happens is that inflation will end at different points in space. And then this is what sources the inhomogeneities and like you know, photon distributions or matter distributions. So different regions play different amounts. Another way to say this is that the infilton fluctuations will induce fluctuations of the metric. So if we neglect tensor fluctuations, which are for our purposes negligible, um, the spatial part of the metric will just be the standard FRW factor, the homogeneous factor, plus a small um, perturbation known as the scalar curvature perturbation, which parameterizes these inhomogeneities induced by the infilton fluctuations. Okay. All observations to date um, of the CMB and large scale structure are consistent with the CR curvature perturbation, zeta, being a Gaussian field with just Gaussian statistics. It has no, we have not seen connected three point functions or four point functions of zeta yet. And this Gaussian, the, the power spectrum of this Gaussian field is nearly Harrison's, it, it satisfies a nearly, nearly Harrison's Aldovich uh, scale bearing Harrison's Aldovich power spectrum, which just means it goes like 1 over k cubed times k to some small power. Okay, so that was pretty much the introduction to inflation. Um, now I'm going to talk about non gaussianes which again have not been seen, but um, we'll talk about how they, they could be seen in large scale structure or possibly the C and D. Um, all right, so the simplest single field inflation models, which I just described, uh, predict zeta to be a nearly Gaussian field. There are small non gaussianes however, um, they're generally it's generally pretty small. If we were to observe non Gaussianes in zeta, that would be evidence for physics beyond these simple single field models. It might also be evidence for inflation itself. Um, one way to generate size with non Gaussianes is through interactions between the infilton and extra fields that might have been present during inflation. If we were to measure these non Gaussianes, it might actually help us determine the correct theory of inflation. What, was, what fields were present during inflation? What were the interactions between those fields and the infilton? So in this vein, it is interesting to explore models that can give rise to unique non-Gaussian signatures because if they're unique and we see the signature, it'll be easier to pinpoint exactly what theory it gave rise to. Uh, so why do you um, say that having non-Gaussian these unique signatures is useful for beyond single field form? If they're sizable, it's typically beyond that. It's hard to get large non Gaussians in single field models. So the first line is supposed to mean it's basically Gaussian. So nearly is just to be precise. And the second line is saying that if you want to see anything that's beyond Gaussian, it has to be bigger than just what you would have gotten in the first line. Yeah, and it's easier to get bigger non Gaussians by adding extra fields that interact with the other time. When you say beyond the simplest single field models, that could mean a lot of things, right? Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean multi field models, no. it could mean yeah. some other models. Even okay. single field models. Okay. Okay. There are single field models that can give rise to the size of the non gas names. I'm not going to talk about those. They're both, I'm going to be talking about multi field models. Well, you have further qualification, simplest single field models. Okay. Did I read that? Yeah. 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 Okay. You're safe. I try to be intentionally <laughs> vague. <laughs> 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 yeah. Doing pretty creative with these models. Okay. Um, I'm just give like a little primer on non-gaussianes. It's just very basic. Uh, so we will be primarily interested in the three four point functions of this uh, field zeta. We'll be looking at the momentum, momentum space. Um, we're going to be looking at the expectation values of zeta and um, yeah, the, the three point function, four point functions, and we're going to be looking at their expectation values evaluated. At right at the time that inflation ends. And this is what kind of sets up the initial conditions for the subsequent evolution of the universe. Uh, 
these expectation values are a little bit different than um, you know the standard scattering amplitudes that we can get in field theory, which time evolved the in and out states to minus and plus infinity. We're going to be computing these expectation values at a common time, so we'll be using like the Schwinger Kelvin and M formula. Uh, because uh, inflation is nearly as well. Inflation has uh, spatial translational invariance, which is why the, um, these momentum will have to satisfy a momentum conserved delta function. And then what's multiplying these, these delta functions will be the bi spectrum, what's known as the bi spectrum for the three point, which is a function of three wave vectors, and then the tri spectrum for the four point, a function of four wave vectors. Question? Yeah. What time are these coordinates calculated? Right at, I have phi n before. It's, I meant to, yeah, it's, it's a good question. So, I'll be taking these to occur at conformal time tau equals zero, and then I'll say that by convention, inflation occurs before that time. It's just convention. Great. So the bi-spectrum and tri-spectrum are uh, functions of three and four moments, and they have a lot of information. We actually will not be interested in all that information from the observables that we'll be talking about. What we're really interested in are the squeezing class limits of the bi-spectrum and tri-spectrum. And to gain some intuition to what that means, let's go to position space. So the squeezing collapse limits probe kind of a long distance physics behind these three and four point functions. For the three point function, you evaluate zeta at one point very far away from two other points which are spatially close together. In Fourier space, this just means that you have one wave vector that's much smaller than the other wave vector characterizing the separation between these two points. And then for the chart spectrum, you have something similar. The four points comes in, come in pairs of two, where the two points are where two of the points are close together, but the pairs are very far apart. And again, you'll have one wave vector in Fourier space that's much smaller than the other two. Question. So these are again in the simplest model where you have one field and Gaussian integral. I haven't specified exactly what model we'll be talking about, um, but we're going to be mostly concerned with what if you add an extra massive scalar field, and we'll see that. The non Gaussians and these limits can potentially get very large if this extra scalar field is math, uh, has small mass compared to the Hubble constant. You already mentioned that there's no in and out formalism, kind of LSD formalism. So uh, are you replacing that by in in formalism yeah. here? Yeah. Is that a kind of an established procedure in the yeah. community, in in formalism? Yeah. You just time evolve the states, kind of just like you do in Pascan, except you just time evolve the states to a common time. Mm -hmm. There's a, I, I kind of write down a formula for how to relate the full interaction picture correlation function in terms of the interaction, or the, the fully interacting correlation function in terms of the interacting picture fields. Right. A lot of words. Okay, so these squeezing collapse limits will be particularly interesting for when you look at um, the correlation functions involving matter density fluctuations at long distance scales. And they also um, can affect the low L multiple moments of the cosmic microwave background. Just to mention that. Okay, so why are we concerned, aside from that, from an inflationary standpoint, why are we, why are we concerned with squeezing collapse limits? Well, it turns out that they reveal pretty important information about the, if they can be observed, they reveal interesting information about the spins and masses of the particles that would be interacting with the inflaton to produce these correlation functions. So it can show, one can show using general arguments about conformal symmetry, which inflation approximately has, it's approximately just sitting around that time, that um, for a Y class of theories, for example, the squeeze by spectrum, if you look at momentum space, will go like a ratio of the larger wave vector to the smaller wave vector to this power of three minus alpha, all right? As this smaller wave vector goes to zero, so take these points very, very far apart. The power that um, the bi spectrum goes as, as chaos goes to zero, depends on this, this parameter alpha, which is related to the spin and mass of the particle in this way. And we see that if the spin is zero, and, um, oh, sorry, uh, there's a, there should be a three halves minus this here. Sorry, I should have fixed that. There should be a three halves minus the square root here. But as for zero spin and as the mass goes to zero, this alpha factor, if it's written correctly, goes to zero. And then you'll see that the squeeze by spectrum and the collapse tri spectrum go like one over ks cubed. So you can get this huge power law growth as ks goes to zero, which could potentially be safe if the non-gaussian is large enough. 
All right, so everything I've been saying so far has been pretty general for like a wide class of theories. So what was the spin dependence in that story? The spin. Uh, if I have higher spin, what happens? It weakens the power law growth. Alpha becomes larger. Uh, and you don't care if it is mass for mass as high spin, I guess, uh, at this point. Uh, you can have, yeah, I mean, no, I don't care. Yeah, at first. But I'm not going to be talking about. I'm, I'm interested in the largest enhancements one can get. So I'm going to look at the spinless particles for this purpose. And in principle, I could have an infinite tower of massless high spins. They, yeah. they can have a coherent effect, right? That's not ruled out, I guess. I guess not. Okay. All right. So the theory that we will be mostly concerned with is something that's it's kind of a branch of theories known as quasi-single field equation theories. So the idea is to get larger non-Gaussianis, one adds extra mass of scalars to the inflationary field content, and these extra scalars are going to be called isocurvitons. So you have the infilton, and then you have isocurvitons. These isocurvitons, they, they never fulfill the role of the infilton at any point, which means that their background bevs never drive the exponential expansion of the universe. Their only purpose is to have quantum mechanical fluctuations which interact with those of the infilton. And it's through these interactions that you get um, potentially observable non gas standards. So it's a set, the theory is like essentially so, single field solar wall equation with enhanced non gas standards. It's like one of the simplest things you can do. But how can you engineer this? So why is it that this wave doesn't drive uh, inflation? What's the difference between it and the tree inflaton? That's actually a great question. So it, it actually takes a little bit of work. So you can write down just a potential for these isocurvitons beds and the infilton, and then you can kind of tune the potential such that the isocurvitons bed doesn't move very much throughout inflation. But so it's, it's really engineered. It is engineered, yeah. it's engineered. And it kind of does, I mean, so my quiet remark, why is it bothers him, bothers me a little bit. Um, one can write down an effective theory where this isn't really a problem, but that's kind of cheap. So. How about supergravity potentials? Do they provide in a somewhat natural way such potentials? Or do, do you see them? Or? I don't know. Mm. I, I just don't know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, hence the theory. Um, you're not going to really have to worry about this expression too much, but I just want to point out a couple of interesting things. So we're going to denote the infilton fluctuation throughout this talk by pi, uh, because and it will be taken to be massless. And as such, we can impose a shift symmetry on this field, to kind of one of the Lagrangian's terms. Um, and this shift symmetry will only be broken by the solar roll potential, but we'll, we'll neglect those corrections. The isocurvitons sigma are going to be denoted by sigma. Sigma i, actually, you can have multiple species of isocurvitons. You can have like a flavor index. If you have theories of multiple isocurvitons, we'll talk about that. And these guys are going to be massive, and they will have no shift symmetry. So the most general quadratic Lagrangian one can write down in a background to sit space time, and after a couple of field redefinitions, is this kind of mess. Note that tau will be conformal time. Um, so you'll notice that this kind of looks more complicated than our usual flat space Lagrangian, and that's because the infilton's background trajectory is time dependent. It breaks, uh, it, it spontaneously breaks time translational variance which means that Lorentz invariance will not be manifest in this action. And you'll have non-trivial, you can in general have non-trivial speeds of sound, as well as kinetic mixings between the isocurvitons and the infilton field, like here. This will be very important, this kinetic mixing. And is there's nothing to be gained in diagonalizing this? Uh, you can, not for general time. I mean, we looked for it, we, we weren't able to. It's, mm -hmm. it's as explicit time dependence. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of beast, as far as beast. Mm -hmm. Right, right there, because of the, because of the square root of minus g. Yeah. Oh, are there free parameters in this Lagrangian? Yes. You can shoot them. This mixing hidden in it has um, terms proportional to phi naught dot, where phi naught is the infiltons classical trajectory. And that, that's just whatever the potential says it is. And we are free to choose the potential. Um, yeah, and these speeds of sound can be whatever they are. If you take, so if if, if I set phi not dot equal to zero, then, then the ample time no longer breaks to, uh, time translational variance, and then this will look like um, your usual flat space Lagrange. These speeds of sound will go to one, these can make things will uh, vanish. All the non-trivial stuff comes from the fact that the, um, 
what's going to call it, the uh, background of the input sign is not zero. So the scalar curvature perturbation that we're interested in computing is very simply related to the input sign fluctuation in this linear relationship right here. So from here on out, we're just going to compute non-gas standings of this pi field. All right. So I just showed you kind of a complicated Lagrangian. Uh, to get the equations of motion for these fields, we'll vary it. And we'll obtain a couple partial differential equations with explicit time dependence. These are, in general, very difficult to solve. We'll have to resort to solving them numerically for general parameters. To make progress in this direction, it's um, convenient to expand these fields in terms of a common basis of raising and lowering operators, A and A dagger. These A and A daggers satisfy a usual raising and lowering operator algebra. But the fields will have different weights for these raising and lowering operators, pi and sigma pi, which uh, and we're going to call these pi's and sigma's will, will be the mode functions, and these will be determined um, by solving the quadratic equations of motion that I uh, hinted to earlier. All right. Um, so we'll solve these mode, equation, mode functions numerically and analytically. So there's no symmetry to help you whatsoever, right, in doing this no. so far? No. What's there's, rotational there's rotational symmetry. That's true. How much rotation? Spatial, spatial rotation. Okay. What's calculated? Hmm? Yes. Yeah. What? Capital Number of fields. A number of fields, yeah. And actually, and the number of isocurves and fields, and then plus one field at the top. Why don't you have SLM symmetry if you have any of these guys? You could have that, but that, um, you don't have to have that. You keep it free. Some parameters may break it. Yeah. To get interesting effects, you actually don't even impose that. It's better if they have different, in the case of old splice curve time, it's better if they have different values. Okay. Um, notice that these mode functions are only functions of this argument. The absolute mag the magnitude of the wave vector in question times tau the conformal time. That's just going to be important. That's an important thing for later on. All right. So everything that I've been saying so far is about the quadratic Lagrangian. Um, to get the non-Gaussians, we need to specify an interaction Lagrangian. In general, the interaction Lagrangian can just consist of the isocurvatons, the inflatons, or products of the inflaton and isocurvaton. For simplicity, we're just going to focus on theories where V sigma i gives rise to the largest interactions. It doesn't have to be this way, but um, for simplicity, we're going to assume that's what it is. And we're just going to assume that this guy can be expanded as a simple cubic plus a quarter term. And here's how these interactions can induce non-Gaussian because, or in, in the zeta variable, because of these common raising and boring operators, you can have non-trivial two-point functions between pi and sigma, giving rise to, so this pi variable can come in, turn into a sigma um, field, and then because of this um, non-linearity, that can have a connected three-point function. All right? So this might be, this trio contribution might be the leading contribution to the inflaton three-point. For the four-point, you might have a quartz contribution, a product of two three-points, and then even quantum loops can give um, kind of interesting effects. Why don't we have pi cubed? Why is it the exception only sigma based? I, I, I just assumed that um, they were just sigma based. It's because the pi interactions, their coefficients are um, typically smaller um, because these these sigmas, these sigmas are like extra fields you're kind of putting into the field. I have freedom to make them as large as I want. The, the, the coupling is as large as I want. So I'm just going to use that freedom to assume for simplicity that they're the largest. Okay. So this is kind of touching on the NM formalism. So we're going to compute these non-Gaussians at the time of the horizon crossing. This requires the NM formalism. And here is the expression for the NM correlator sum operator right in terms of the interaction picture fields. So to get the leading order by spectrum, we just stick in this guy into here just a first order term, per, um, evaluate a couple of contractions, and then one can just find that the bi spectrum has this momentum dependent factor up front times this time integral of the mode functions, the interaction picture mode functions. It's pretty simple. Uh, it's a compact expression, at least. It's straightforward to obtain a similar expression for the tri spectrum, just evaluate a couple more contractions. All right. I'm here. <laughs> That's comforting. Okay. 
So, um, great. So now to evaluate this bias spectrum, we need to determine the mode functions, to some extent at least. So we need to solve the mode equations, and we're going to do this in a few regimes. In the first regime, we're going to assume that the mass of the extra field and its mixing are much larger than H. We're going to look at the regime where the mass and mixing are much less than H. And then finally, at the very end, we're going to look at the case, at what happens when you have multiple isochronic times whose mass and mixing are less than H, somewhat less than H. Um, for simplicity, we're going to assume that all the speeds of sound are unity, and we're going to discard this kinetic measure term. Um, we check numerically that doing so doesn't really change the qualitative results we're going to talk about and what follows. Okay, so if you just have one single mass of ice curves on, then the Lagrangian simplifies to this. It's just a couple of fields that you consider background with some kinetic mixing. Vary it, and then you obtain the following mode equations. They're coupled, they're just because of time dependence. It's pretty difficult to solve in full generality. But thankfully, for the squeeze bias spectrum, by spectrum and collapse tri-spectrum calculations, we don't need to know the full solutions to understand the, the most salient features of non-gas dynamics. Please note that the mode functions only depend on k through this variable a, which is equal to k tau. That'll be important because recall that the squeeze by spectrum and collapse tri-spectrum had one leg whose wave vector was much smaller than the other one. This means then that we can actually just expand the mode function for that squeeze leg, just Taylor expand it in a small AO limit, and then factor out the momentum dependence. So what I'm saying is to determine the momentum dependence of the squeeze and collapse by spectrum tri-spectrum, we just need to um, we, we can we can determine the momentum dependence of those guys just from the small AO behavior of the mode functions. So that's what we're gonna compute. So we just postulate a series form for these mode functions plug this on into the mode equations, and we find that pi and sigma have these time-dependent factors that go like minus a to the alpha minus, where alpha minus is related to the mass and the mixing um, as follows. So we see immediately that if the mass and mixing are large enough, the square root becomes imaginary, and then you can have logarithmic oscillations in eta. But these logarithmic oscillations will decay to zero as alpha minus will be equal, the real part will be equal to three halves. On the other hand, if the mass and mixing are small, then this alpha minus will become very small and then they will slowly decay to zero. All right, great. So then sticking in the small a behavior, the squeeze by spectrum then just becomes this. You see that it'll go like, it'll, it'll display logarithmic oscillations in the ratio of the wave vectors multiplied by this wave vector dependent um, factor that kind of controls the size of these non gas standings. So we see that if we have logarithmic oscillations, then this parameter alpha will be equal to 3 halves. So you'll get logarithmic oscillations, but the amplitude of these oscillations will not be very large. All right, so it's kind of an interesting feature, but it'll be a little bit harder to see. In the other regime, where the mass and mixing are much smaller than H, you will not get these oscillations. This gamma parameter will be zero. However, alpha will be small, and you'll get nearly cubic power law growth as ks goes to zero. And that will be easier. That, that has some chance to be seen, perhaps. Similar results on the prior factor. The only remaining thing to do is to compute this, this time integral over these mode functions. One can just do this numerically. It's pretty easy in the regime where the max, mass and mixing are much larger than h. All you need are the initial conditions for these mode functions, which are just a bunch of these vacuum conditions. Meaning that um, in the very far past, everything should um, reduce to the flat space limit. So that's just saying that like if you go to really small scales and consider it should look like flat space time. And then these mode functions should look like their flat space solutions. The coefficients out in front were determined by uh, demanding that the fields of data cannot have commutation functions. Alright, so one can then just evaluate this time integral numerically, and then this is a plot trying to show. Um, what the squeeze bias spectrum looks like in the limit where the smaller wave vector goes to zero. So you see these kind of pretty logarithmic oscillations. If we saw that in the CMD, that would be kind of evidence for an extra massive scalar field interacting with the infoton during inflation. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, the problem is, note that, um, well, one thing to it's not really a problem. One thing to note is that as the mass of these fields becomes larger, the amplitude becomes smaller, 
This is what's known as the Boltzmann suppression for producing massive particles that are in the center. Um, so while these oscillations would be a striking signature, Did they're getting anti dissitor Dissitor. Okay. While these oscillations would be a striking signature, I am dubious or doubtful that we'll be able to see them just because their amplitude, or as chaos goes to zero, you don't get really strong power law growth. So the amplitude won't be. Why would you just say that? Uh, so you just referred to something that had to do with particle creation, so to speak. Yeah. But nothing before that could do with that. It's just when you. Um, is that, the, is that the, this part of the bunch of the back and forth? No, it's, it's just saying that like if you have an infoton coming in and then you know it mixes it into an isochroton and that branches out, this amplitude, this like offshell amplitude, will just be numerically suppressed by Boltzmann factor. Is this all about strip point functions in your talk? Right here, yes. I'm gonna. So you will do something. I'll talk about. I'm gonna brief for time purposes just. Sure, sure. Something. And then you say squeeze by spectrum, you really mean this triangle with one side being very small? Exactly, that's the picture, yeah. It's just like two mean. long wave vectors. Sure, yeah. okay. This is KS. But your tri spectrum is four point, right? And then that'll have, uh, what is it look like? Uh, so, and then here. So this will be like a, sh a small wave vector, and then these guys will be long, K long one. And the left-hand side is the three-point function, right? Yeah. Okay. The right-hand side is what? The class tri-spectrum. Tri-spectrum is four points. It's four. Yeah. Ah, it's, that's it's confusing. Four it's I confusing, see. yeah. Bi is three and the tri is four, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> it makes no sense. Yeah. No, it's that's not, that's okay. number two. <laughs> I guess, actually, that's true. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Um, in the opposite limit where the mixing and mass are much smaller than H, the squeeze by spectrum will not have the oscillatory factor, but as I said, it'll have the stronger power law growth. So maybe we can see this, and I'll, I'll talk about this in what follows. Um, but let me just first touch on the fact that this integral actually becomes more difficult to solve numerically, and the reason is these mode functions in this limit do not decay to zero as quickly as they did in the case where the mass and mixing were much larger than H. So naively, this integral is higher divergent, and it's kind of challenging because we don't have explicit expressions for these mode functions, so it's not clear how to, how to, well, I'll show you how to proceed, but it wasn't clear a priori. So one can actually show that all the terms that look like they have higher divergences are going to be zero just because of the canonical commutation relation. So we can just use the fact that the canonical commutation relations are satisfied at all times to demand constraints, the following constraints, on the mode functions. Even though we don't know their explicit form, we know that they satisfy these constraints for all the time. We can look at small eight expansions of these constraints to obtain constraints on the power series coefficients of the mode functions. And we'll find, if you, do the, if you do the calculation right, that the combination of power series coefficients multiplying the IR conversion terms vanish. They just vanish. It's kind of miraculous. I don't completely understand it, but it's worked in every case. So that's great. These integrals are IR finite. We can regulate them numerically and then compute them. All right. And then, we did that, and then we viewed the bi spectrum. We found the shape function, which is just defined in this way. There's just a numerical factor up front. It's not very important. And we find that the bi spectrum in this regime of parameter space looks like a local non Gaussian with this shape. So you see it just kind of takes off as the smaller wave vector goes to zero. One can do this, uh, a very analogous calculation for the tri spectrum in the collapse limit one would find that it also grows like 1 over ks cubes in the regime where the mixing and mass are much less than h. And ks is, again, uh, the wave vector carried by this intermediate line. What is scale with small k? ks, so there, there are two, well, I guess, three scales for the tri spectrum for these three wave vectors. And then ks is the wave vector in between. And if that ks is much smaller than the wave vectors carried by these external legs, then you're in the class on it. In, in a very quick way, uh, if, how does your result compare with uh, Arkani Ham and Maldusena calculation uh, for the they, three point case? They can get, I think they can get these coefficients for alpha minus in terms of the mass and mixing of the uh, isocurvaton, but I don't think with their arguments 
just using conformal symmetry, they would be able to get the numerical factor carried by this integral. But if you think of the size of the effect, though, how would you compare the magnitude of I mean, it depends on what theory they're talking. I mean, hmm. they, they, they talked about a couple of theories in their paper. Mm -hmm. um, they talked about like a conformal scalar. I don't think that gives as large an effect. Hmm. I could be wrong. Whereas um, in your case, you can play with the parameters still having the curvatons you want. And you can enhance the effect. Yeah. yeah. If you choose the mass to be, I mean, whatever nature decides, it decides, but. Um, for theoretical purposes, if the mass is small enough, you can get as big an effect as uh, you want, basically. Well, I mean, it'll grow, it, it can't grow faster than cubic. Um, but yeah, you can get it arbitrarily close to cubic growth. As chaos goes to zero. Okay, so this is kind of what I've been building up for. It's like the punchline. So this nearly um, cubic power law growth in the squeeze bispectrum and class trispectrum could be observed in large scale structure. The reason is because, just take it from me, that the matter over density is related to the scalar curvature perturbation through this relationship. The matter over density is just saying, if I look at a point in space and count the amount of like just matter or like dark matter in that point in space, and then divide it by the average amount of matter in the rest of space, then um, that, that, that quantity is the over density at that point. If I Fourier transform that, it's really it's a scalar curvature perturbation like this. So if we see sizable non-Gaussians in zeta, we might be able to see sizable non-Gaussians in delta, which we couldn't observe. This is a smoothing function to kind of smooth the matter distribution because it's just like a bunch of point particles. But if you smooth it, you can get like a continuous field. This T of K is the transfer function, which kind of tells you how the gravitational potential once, once it enters the horizon. Uh, evolves between like radiation domination and today, at least for the um, small scale modes that we are considering here in this talk. So this it's only a linear relationship when you're at like k much less than k nonlinear, which is when these um, when the matter that's the scale at which the matter becomes nonlinear. But at long distance scales, it's linear. When you use this relationship. So we do not see the matter over density directly. Dark matter. However, dark matter will come together into halos, which have galaxies, and we can see those. So um, we can kind of count the dark matter by counting the number of halos. So dark matter halos are then biased objects, which means that at large scales they can be written in terms of the matter over density as so. And then, and then what, I'm, what I'm building up to is saying that the non-Gaussians and zeta can then affect the correlation functions involving delta halo. And we can observe that and then see if these effects are really there. Okay. The simplest correlation function we can, involve, we can um, compute involving delta halo is the two point function. If we Fourier transform, it's just a function of this variable ks. And it'll, be a, um, it'll have three contributions if you have these non Gaussians. One just from the Gaussian contribution. These blobs are supposed to represent the points um, that the halos occupy that you're looking at. Um, one from the Gaussian piece, one from the bispectrum, and one from the trispectrum. As chaos gets very small, then you start probing the squeeze and collapse limits of the bispectrum and the trispectrum. The only thing that I want you to note is that relative to the Gaussian piece, the bispectrum and trispectrum pieces go like 1 over chaos squared and 1 over chaos to the fourth, meaning that as chaos goes to zero, the non Gaussian pieces get much larger than the Gaussian piece. And if we can observe a deviate, we, if we go to large enough length scales, we can just look at the distribution, and we know the Gaussian prediction. If we observe the deviation from that, that might be evidence for these non-Gaussian All right. Well, unfortunately, these non-Gaussians cannot be as big as we want. They are constrained by CMB measurements, um, which then in turn constrain the size of the triple prime. So what Planck does is it'll constrain these parameters um, that kind of characterize the shape of the non-Gaussianis. So for the local shape that we're most concerned with, F and L is defined as the squeeze by spectrum divided by the product of the power spectrum. And F and L is constrained to be minus 0.9 plus or minus 5.1. I think that's the most recent constraint. If we start saturating two single bounds, saying that F and L is around 10 or minus 10, then we see that these non-Gaussian effects, here I'm plotting the power spectrum including the non-Gaussianis divided by the power spectrum without them, 
these non-gaussian effects start taking off at around 0.005 h inverse megaparsec. That's good because future large-scale structure surveys like Spherix are just going to start being able to probe these distance scales. I haven't done a very like I, I just haven't done any numerical like forecasting for like how much like for example Spherix will be able to constrain V triple prime. All I'm trying to say is that we're just starting to be able to explore this regime where these non-gaussian effects could be observed. All right. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of skip over the stuff about loops. Just know that loops can also give rise to interesting long-distance effects that could be seen in um, the power spectrum phase. Um, let me just briefly touch on the three-point function. So we saw that for the halo power spectrum, non-Gaussian effects started at around 0.005 h inverse megaparsec. One question one could ask is, can these non-Gaussian effects become more pronounced at smaller scales in other observables? perhaps even the halo three-point function, okay? So what we did is we just computed the halo three-point function in this theory. It requires a few more diagrams that are a little bit more difficult to compute, but we did it. But alas, we found that the non-Gaussian effects started taking off at around the same scale as they did for the two-point function. Um, notice, though, that like once the non-Gaussian effects start taking off, they really start get, getting going. Um, they get much larger than they did in the halo two-point, but um, Unfortunately, they just start at the, around the same length separation as they did in the halo two point. All right, so for the final part, like final just few slides, uh, let me talk about what happens when you have more than one isocurvaton in the theory. Well, in that case, you can have kinetic mixing amongst the isocurvatons themselves, and this can give rise to a kind of new phenomena in the non Gaussianians of zeta. Um, we're going to also, for simplicity, just take a single cubic interaction in the sigma one field. All right. So remember when I said that uh, we can get kind of full momentum dependence of the squeeze and collapse by spectrum and tri spectrum just by looking at the small a limit of the mode functions. So we just do the exact same thing again, the same calculation. Uh, so they could potentially have logarithmic uh, oscillations as eta goes to zero, whose amplitude will decay to zero as its power eight minus eta to the alpha. Recall before, though, when there was only one isocurvaton, one could only achieve these logarithmic oscillations when this coefficient alpha, or this uh, power law alpha, was equal to three halves, meaning that the modes would oscillate, but these oscillations would decay quickly as eta goes to zero. If you have more than one isocurvaton present, and you have this kinetic mixing amongst the isocurvatons, one can obtain non-zero oscillations as well as alpha less than three halves meaning that these modes will oscillate, but their oscillations will decay slowly. And that's going to induce some new interesting effects in non-gaussianities. And just here are a couple of sample parameters that kind of give rise to like um, a smaller alpha with a non-zero gamma. So recall that the squeeze by spectrum in the theory with only a cubic interaction can be written as such, where you have, where you have uh, sinusoids that have logarithmic oscillations in the ratio of the wave vectors multiplied by an amplitude that goes like ks over kl to the minus 3 plus alpha power. In multi isocurvaton theory, this is the point, you can have nearly cubic log growth as ks goes to zero, as well as logarithmic oscillations. Each of, remember that each of these behaviors could only be achieved in separate limits of the single isocurvaton model, where the mass of the mixing were much less than h, and the mass of the mixing were much greater than h. Somehow, by having multiple isocurvatons with kinetic mixing, you can combine these effects. All right, and then one can just compute the shape function uh, like before, and then one finds that in the black that I, I've shown kind of the local, the local non-Gaussian shape that we got uh, in the region where U and M are much less than H for single isocurvaton QSFI, and here's the multi-isocurvaton QSFI shape. We see that the right curve has logarithmic oscillations, but the amplitude keeps up almost to the local non-Gaussian shape. This is a new shape template. I haven't seen it before. I don't think Planck has constrained such a shape template before. Um, we give a template in our paper, and yeah, maybe they could look for this shape uh, in their data set. Uh, let me just note that the tri-spectrum also will display logarithmic oscillation, oscillations as well as nearly cubic power log growth. And then again, one can 
you know, use these non-Gaussian units to compute the halo halo two point function. And one finds that the two point function will have will have oscillations as well. It's kind of an interesting shape. Remember before it just went like up. Now it just it, it goes up, but it oscillates up. And you have these uh, um, interactions amongst the multiplies of curves on. Notice, though, that the non-Gaussian contributions do not become as pronounced as they did in the single isocurrence on QS5. And that's because I didn't show this explicitly, but there's a numerical factor out front that depends on an integral of those momentum-dependent factors that uh, Will asked about earlier. And the oscillations actually wash out those integrals, making the numerical contributions of the non-Gaussian is smaller than they were before. Great. So let me conclude. So, for more than non Gaussian is observed, we tell us about the fields present during inflation and their interactions. We looked at non Gaussian is and quasi single field inflation with one isocurrent sign in the limits where the mass and the mixing of the isocurrent sign with the input sign were much larger than H, and the mass and the mixing were much less than H. In the limit where they were much greater than H, the bispectrum displayed oscillations, but only grew as 1 over Ks of 3 has power in the squeeze limit. In the opposite limit, the bispectrum didn't oscillate, but it grew 1 as 1 over Ks cubed. And was much, the non Gaussian is much more sizable. These non Gaussian could be potentially observable in future large scale structure surveys, such as Sphere X, if they're big enough. We investigated a theory within quasi single field inflation that had multiple uh, isocurvatons. We found that there could be a new kinetic mixing amongst the isocurvatons, which could cause the mode functions to oscillate at great times. The non Gaussians then display uh, oscillations as well as strong power law growth. Each of these features could only be achieved in separate limits of the single isocurrent sign uh, model. This is a new shape for the, they gave us a new shape for the bispectrum, which could potentially be observed in the CMB. Um, as a future direction, it might be interesting to look at correlation fu functions involving the tensor fluctuations in the metric. I haven't talked about that at all. Um, it just might be something interesting to look at. And another question is, are there other observables that are affected by the long distance behavior of these non gaussians instead of like the Hale correlation functions? Thank you for your attention.